Have you ever heard of a performing art called poi ball dancing, which is more commonly known as poi? If you have never visited the Hawaiian Islands, I highly doubt you do. But that's why I'm here to educate you. I think the first thing you're all thinking is, what is poi? Well, poi is a scale toy that requires a pair of swinging tethered weights that are made using different materials, such as rolled up paper mache or crumpled up newspapers into bolts that are then tethered with braided rope or string, depending on how you prefer to practice. If you enjoy dancing, then you understand that many dancers love dancing because they like to express themselves and project their emotions and feelings through dance physically. Well, this is exactly the same case when I perform play. This form of art allows me to use hand gestures and movements with the balls in hand to create visuals so that the audience can see various shapes and techniques. It's similar to how people tell stories because you are using body language to formulate the story. If you need a more graphic idea, of what poi ball dancing looks like, let me provide you as an example most people in the media will know. If you have ever watched Attack on Titan, on season 1, episode 18, the female Titan swings multiple soldiers to death like this in circular motions, with the soldier's role in this case being the poi balls. She swings them in a circular motion like I just said, which is a technique that all beginner poi dancers learn as a start to the more complicated techniques. Now for this next segment, I'd like to tell you all a bit of um, the history about the poi balls itself. Poi balls actually originate off with New Zealand, not from Hawaii, in which indigenous Polynesian people called the Maori used poi as weapons in war. The balls in history were practically weapons, as instead of ball shaped newspaper, men would use, um, well, in war, men would use rocks that had flax cords tied at the end instead of safe, um, the safe versions we use today. Besides utilizing them for the purposes of war, the Maori would use them to enhance their flexibility and strength in their upper body, like their hands and arms specifically, as well as imp um, improving coordination. Nowadays, the current practice of poi is not at all like the history from the past. It's more safe. So basically today, it is actually more common to see female dancers instead of male dancers swing poi around while performing instead of, yeah. Of course, the dance is available to anyone, however. That's not, that's always like, it's a very um, inclusive thing. Also, kids in primary schools can have the option to be taught poi at very young ages, like just like I was. In Hawaii, we have come to preserve and adopt this aspect of the Polynesian culture, and I'm actually very glad that I have learned such a unique and traditional skill to this day because no one really knows about it here in California and stuff, so yeah, that's cool. So now you know all about poi. I actually highly encourage you to watch videos on social media if you're interested in learning some techniques, or maybe just because you got your curiosity. If you ever visit Hawaii, the Polynesian Cultural Center actually teaches people from all over the world how to dance with poi. So that would be a great experience. I hope you enjoyed my informative speech and thank you for listening. <laughs> okay, your speech was three minutes and four seconds. Uh, for feedback, I think you were very clear and like you had a good speed and tone. And like, I liked your hand gestures and you were like showing how the things were shaped. And I don't know, was, I liked like you, like at first you talked about like what the poi dancing is. And then you like explained the history. Then you talked about like, you could learn a, like you could learn it if you go like to Hawaii and learn it. Like, like it was really good. And it's, that's really cool, your topic. Have you ever wondered how a movie set was produced or how its sound effects were composed? In the speech today, you'll understand the inner workings and importance of technical theater. Raise your hand if you've ever been curious about what it is like being backstage or on set during the filming of a television show. There are multiple ways to get here, whether it be through an occupation, tour, or other methods, and many more ways to learn about it. Today, I'll be talking about crews or the different section of technical theater construction or the processes that go into producing and consequences or the importance of technical theater to the entertainment industry. Firstly, I'll talk about tech, I'll talk about tech crews. There are two types, technological tech crews and manual tech crews. The technological crews include lighting, sound, and special effects. The manual crews include sets, scenic properties, costumes, and makeup. Each of these have their own special roles. Lighting works to light up the stage and actors with devices, such as the DMX-512. Here's what the DMX-512 looks like. This commonly controls stage lighting and effects. Sound works to play composed music and sound effects. 
Special Effects works to create creative and realistic effects on stage. Sets works to build each set piece out of any given material. Scenic works to paint each set piece to fit the scene. There are specific guidelines that are commonplace for members of these crews to follow when completing their assignments outlined in the United States Institute for Theater Technology. Properties works to gather relevant props for actors. Costumes works to create and fit special outfits for makeup. Makeup works to design and apply special effects makeup. Now that you know about the different crews, you can now learn about the ways they help produce media. Managing each section of each technical theater is different depending on what type of set you're on. For entertainment made for television, both the technological and manual sides are different compared to performing arts. For performing arts, on the technological side, a group made of lighting, sound, and special effect crew members controls their respective devices from the tech booth, which is usually located above or facing the stage. On the manual side, members of the sets and scenic crews join to form the running crew, who delivers the set pieces and props to their proper places during blackouts in between scenes. There's also a difference in cost of production. According to the numbers, the film Avatar from 2009's production budget was around $237 million, while the production budget for Les Mis, a popular musical from 2012, was around $65 million. After understanding the different ways technical crews promote the creation of media depending on the form, you can now comprehend the significance of this help to the media industry as a whole. Finally, I will discuss the impact modern technical theater has had on the entertainment industry and society overall. Before the 1950s, television was entirely in black and white. For example, here's a scene from an old TV show. However, due to developments in technology and the advancement of the industry, television, film, and the performing arts have visually improved by a very large amount. It is the same with audio aspects. Before, the dialogue in shows or movies was not very clear at times. Now, it is always clear, and realism and sound effects and ambiance have improved significantly. In regards to society, many different and unique skills are fostered and put to use in the technical side of the entertainment industry, such as handling electronics or painting beautiful scenery. Due to this, many different job opportunities and career paths are made available. According to the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are over 270,000 arts, design, entertainment, sports, and media occupations related to technical theater as of May 2020. You learn what the different crews of technical theater are and what their roles are when producing as well as impacting the media being constructed. You also learn what the positive consequences of modern technical theater are and what the industry would look like without it. Aspects of technical theater are everywhere, from lighting pictures and speakers to painted murals and structural architecture. In theater or entertainment, made for television or film, these aspects are much more important and can change the outcome of a production. The next time you watch a movie or a television show, stage play or musical, Look for, notice, and acknowledge the hard work the technical crews put into it. Thank you. Your time is four minutes and 20. 21 seconds? Okay. Is that? Um, I was like, really intrigued with your story and your, your speech in general. But I liked how you talked about like, more than just um, like how um, the tech stuff is used today. You also talk, you also dealt into the past, um, near third, near fourth. And um, your your main points are also you know, like they are separated like um, really really clearly, so it's really easy to understand like um, which section is for what part. Thank you. Everywhere in society, individuals spend most of their lives looking for their passion, finding something they love and are good at. In job interviews, college applications, and daily small talk. The main thing a person wants to know about you is what is your passion in life? What do you like to do? However, the question I want to talk about today is how do you find your passion in life? As for me, my passion is dance. How about you? Raise your hand if you know your passion. Okay, well, whether you know it or not, it's okay. Because it actually turns out that according to a research survey done by the New York Times, only 25% of American adults are confident in their life passion, while the rest either don't know or are unsure about the topic entirely. But how do you become one of the 25% out of the 100% where the 75% are the ones who are unsure about the subject? 
Well, from my personal experience, if you have the proper mindset and undergo the ideas of Einstein's theory of relativity, along with the concept of leisure work and take action on it, then there's your answer. But first, let's start off with your mindset. To keep it simple, you have to approach things with an open mind because you don't want to be looking for your passion in life and you've already rejected it. Sometimes you might be avoiding something just because you're initially not good at it. Or maybe someone might tell you that, oh, you shouldn't do that. But just because you're initially not good at it doesn't mean you shouldn't go for it. For example, former professional basketball player Michael Jordan actually didn't want to initially play basketball in, in grade school. And he was actually more interested in playing baseball. But as you probably know, he, over time, through being open-minded with his talents, he went on to be considered one of the greatest basketball players of all time. And it became his passion. Passions can indeed change, and one can have multiple passions in life. They can come early in one's life or later. But if you really dig deep and always persist with an open mind, then you'll find it. I also found that the famous theory of relativity from the well-renowned Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies research paper by Einstein himself can also help you discover your passion in life. Einstein states that time is an illusion that moves relative to an observer. Every time I dance, time stops, and no matter how tired I am, I could go forever, since relative to me, time stops while from an outside observer, time keeps going. My dance mentor described the best. He explained that when time stops, when you love what you're doing, that time stops when you love what you're doing. And this has proven very true in my life. If you find something you love to do that makes you forget the existence of time entirely, then you're already a part of the one out of four people from earlier. Uh, connecting to the idea of how it relates to one's passion is the idea of leisure work. But what does leisure work mean? If you think about the definitions of the word leisure and work, individually it doesn't really make sense, it doesn't connect, since their definitions kind of contradict each other. But what I mean when I say leisure work is that your passion shouldn't really feel like anything forced or it shouldn't feel like labor. This doesn't mean that pursuing a passion will always come easy because it will almost never come easy. What I mean is that the hard work behind your passion should be pretty enjoyable. In my case, training and working out for dance doesn't really feel like I'm training and working out. It's just for me something fun that I like to do in my free time and I choose to do it in my free time. So if you have to proper mindset and commit yourself to something you love to do, you will find your passion and succeed. But how do you find, how do you know it's your passion? Because of the three things that I gave you earlier, open-mindedness, the theory of relativity, and leisure work. If you do those three things and look for those three things and something you love to do, then that's your passion in life. Now go out there and find your passion and pursue it. And I'll be pursuing mine, you'll be pursuing yours, and we'll meet at the top. Thank you. Okay, your speech was four minutes and 19 seconds, which is good. Uh, for feedback, um, your hand gestures are really good. <laughs> I, I like how you connected like, like the theory of relativity, like that's not something <laughs> that someone would automatically connect with like dance or passions or whatever, but I liked it. And it was just like, it was good because you could tell that like dance is something that you obviously are really passionate about. So it was really good. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mark. And today I would like to talk to you about how you yourself can prepare for your next job interview. When applying for a job, most people find it frightening the process of the interview itself also come unprepared and unexpected, alternately setting themselves up for failure. But today, I will discuss how you can succeed by developing an overall positive attitude, uh, deciding your attire, and establishing good communication skills. So, have you ever felt anxious just thinking about the upcoming interview? It is, you know, everybody goes through this, we can just uh, we just are not prepared. So you can rid of this by teaching you how to gain confidence to walk into the room by learning the basic preparation skills that I've prepared for you. We're gonna talk about the attitude and you must have 
when you're talking to interview, your attire must wear and how to communicate properly. Your attitude when present in an interview sets the overall tone throughout. So your chances of getting the job significantly increase if you have a nice and positive attitude. And uh, Forbes magazine states that getting a good night's sleep will be the most important factor in this since you'll be awake, more attentive, and more focused. And uh, yes, you could be more confident by just getting a better night's sleep. You, you must also you must also try to be as polite, polite as you can since uh, you know you want to keep a positive attitude. Just keep a smile on your face throughout the interview because you want to just want to lighten up the mood. And just don't try to argue with the interview because you're the one that's trying to get the job. It doesn't really make sense to just try and have a like a negative attitude towards your boss, essentially. So yeah, the attitude you start yourself with during the interview will make the interviewer want to hire you. However, the attitude that you choose to wear that day can be the deciding factor, even if your attitude is like top tier. The attire that you're going to wear is the first thing that the interviewer will see, and this is the first impression, which can be the deal breaker between you and getting that job. You come in with the best impression, walk in clean. Just make sure your shirt has no wrinkles, no stains, and take a shower beforehand. And as for the clothes you want to wear, it's just a, it's some form of setting. So I have a, I have a picture right here. It's a, uh, it's business casual. So it's just like nothing, nothing, nothing crazy. Just a nice button up, a little dress as well. And uh, you know, you don't have to go, you don't have to spend a lot of money on this since uh, you don't, you don't really have to like, like go crazy. It's just like the interviewer won't, you won't care how much money you spend on it. Just make sure you look nice. And after preparing, after preparing your attire, just consider the purpose interview of the interview, which is just to communicate. So communicating well with the interviewer, you must know what to say and just try your best to put on your words. Because, like, you could prepare for this by just predicting what the interviewer will say. So, like, depending on where you work, you might ask, like, if you work at a pizza place, you're gonna ask. Know, what are your previous job experiences in the fast food industry? And but you can't, you know, you can't, you can't predict the future. So just try your best to prepare for just like random questions as well. But just keep in mind that you can't predict some of these questions. And try to respond clearly and coherently because again, you're trying to be confident. So don't start up on your words. And make sure that you're listening as well. Listen and be coherent. Just uh. Yeah. Answer the best you can in the lesson that you're given. And having having learned all of this, you can now take these concepts through and walk into that interview room and get that job. So, and knowing the skill, it prepares you for the, the next challenge that you'll have in your adulthood because you know, this is not the only formal, like, it's not the only formal setting that you'll be in. You'll be in meeting rooms and all that. So, knowing this is your first step. Everyone starts somewhere, and everyone has the ability to succeed by following the correct course of action. Okay, so your time was uh, four minutes and forty seconds. So, what one thing I liked about the the speech is like, it was it was cool, because like, it felt like you were actually like advising. Me, like it sounds like you're like actually having a conversation like oh this is like what you got to do and like it sounds like you're actually trying to help me out <laughs> and like uh yeah i just thought that was really cool um for me i liked it i liked how relevant the topic was to us since we're like at the age where we start looking for jobs and i liked your examples but i like how you're like suggestions were like positive, but still like realistic. Like you said, we can't predict the future, but we should still try our best. And like, I think you had a good speed and your tone. I think it was a little bit casual, but I think it was still pretty solid. 